Well, thank you, everybody, for hanging on. Um, you know, this this long for this session. I'm sure you've all got trains, planes, and automobiles to to catch. Um, but of course, this is a, an important topic, and we've been listening all day to um, and yesterday to applied science um, and the ways that we as scientists. Um, can make an impact in, in managing and conserving plant diversity. But I want to take us to, to the bigger picture, really, and, and look at ways in which we might organize ourselves, and particularly within botanic gardens, uh, and how we might, might think about tackling what is a really overwhelming uh, issue. Uh, I, I've just been reviewing about 60 Darwin Initiative proposals over the last few weeks at stage one. And I, I, you know, I said to, to the rest of the, the committee, we need some sort of counselling because uh, everyone who puts in the proposals paints a, a hor horrific picture uh, of what needs fixing and so on. And it, it, it really is frightening the scale of the, of the issues that we're facing. And of course, we're familiar with those. We're familiar with the impact on, on plant diversity in particular. Um, work that's been done, done here and elsewhere, one in five of the world's plant species threatened with extinction. Um, and the, the major driver for that uh, is um, transform landscapes, it's, it's landscape change. I took this picture on, on the left last year up in Zambia in one of the, the remotest areas in, in Zambia, in the Mafinga Mountains, which is two days drive and then a day's walk up onto the watershed up the top here. This feeds the Luangwa River, which then feeds into the Zambezi. Um, and all around the, the bottom of this area are people, uh, very high densities of people. And although there's no settlements on the top, um, there are hunters up there, there's cattle up there, uh, and what appears to be a pristine landscape, of course, is influenced um, by uh, the people who are, who are all around at the bottom and, and using those resources. And that will have impacts on the plant diversity there, on dispersers um, and pollinators and so on. In all the time that we were up there, we didn't see a, a single animal. Um, and, and very few birds. Uh, and that, of course, uh, impacts um, on the plant diversity there. And I think we have to get used to the fact that transformed landscapes are the norm, um, and those are increasing as human populations uh, increase. Uh, and the problem that we have is that we can create protected areas uh, in a proportion of that landscape, but all of those plants that used to live uh, in those transformed landscapes uh, are, are under threat which means that we, um, as a species, have to find ways to live with them. Uh, we have to find ways to, to manage those. Um, and over the last couple of days, uh, we've heard many talks on why this is important. Uh, we need plants. We need plants for, for food security, new crops. Um, we need plants for water scarcity, um, energy. Think of biomass, fuels, wood fuels, and so on. Human health, biodiversity conservation itself, because plants are at the base of the trophic pyramid, uh, adaptation and mitigation to climate change. We cannot live without plants, and that means we need to, to better manage that diversity. And the way that we uh, have always tried to frame this uh, is not in threat that we're all going to die if we lose the odd plant species, um, but in opportunity that plant diversity enables human innovation, adaptation, and resilience. And we've heard a number of talks today and yesterday um, about ways in which we might use plants in, in novel ways. But the simple fact is that if we reduce those options, uh, we reduce plant diversity, then, then we reduce those options for human innovation, adaptation, and resilience. That's putting aside all of the ethical questions just from um, the perspective uh, of human survival into the future. So what is the role of, uh, of botanic gardens? What, what can we do about this realistically? And I'm, I'm going to take this down to species conservation because um, there's a lot of people and a lot of communities working on habitat conservation. That's, that's extremely important. But what about all of those species that are going to fall off the planet because nobody knows that they're even there? Uh, and I think that's where, where we can come in. Um, and one null hypothesis that when I was at Kew, we test drove, I think, um, maybe 10, 10 years ago, was that there is no technological reason why any plant species should become extinct. That needs to be our, our null hypothesis, uh, in that we have a huge array of techniques. 
um, from horticulture, and more on that in a moment, to seed banking, to tissue culture, and so on. That means, in theory, if we can get to these plants in time, we have the opportunity to conserve them uh, and better manage them uh, in the landscape. Uh, and this is where botanic gardens come in. We, um, we know how to manage diverse species assemblages of plants. It's something that we do in our day-to-day our -day lives. Uh, and this is our resource. Um, there are 3,000 odd botanic gardens uh, around the world. Um, some of them better resourced than others, and I have a whole other talk on that, that 80% um, of these gardens are in the northern hemisphere, not where the plant diversity is. Um, but we're conserving um, and managing, at least, a, a wide uh, array of, of, of plants across the taxonomic spectrum. And thinking about how we might organize ourselves in the most cost-effective, rational way, um, I was lucky enough to work um, with the, the Global Crop Diversity Trust and to get to know the crop community. This is Svalbard, of course. This is the, the, the famous seed vault, which always used to irritate us at the Millennium Seed Bank when we said we have um, the biggest seed bank in the world. And they'd say, well, do you mean that one up in the Arctic Circle? No, we didn't mean that one. We meant, but they meant this one. Um, and this, is, of course, is the flagship for the, the crop trust and also for uh, the crop community. And they have what they call a global system. Um, if you look at um, the Global Plan of Action for Plant Genetic Resources in Food and Agriculture, then this is what the global system um, for the conservation and sustainable use of crop diversity looks like. There's a global plan, um, a review process, which is FAO's state of the, the world's plant genetic resources in food and agriculture. There's a network of international institutions and ex situ collections. The Svalbard Seed Vault is just the backup for those, but the CG 11 gene banks in the CGIAR at the center of that network, but also some significant national gene banks, including the USDA's Fort Collins and, and others. They have a global portal to accession level data, so Genesis, if you want, you're a crop breeder and you want to go in and you want to find um, a specific um, cultivar or land race or whatever, then you, you can go in through Genesis. Um, and the crop community is working on a, a universal gene bank information management system at the accession level based on Grin Global, the USDA system. And they're developing some of the advanced bioinformatic tools that uh, allow crop breeders to, to mine genetic data um, and characterization data. So what about us um, in botanic gardens? Um, what do we have? Well, we have a similar, potentially a similar architecture We've got a strategy, that's the, the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, which actually was the Convention on Biological Diversity's first work plan with measurable targets. Uh, and that continues um, to exist. We're carrying out a review at the moment for the COP next year, for Substra and the COP next year, uh, on progress against the targets uh, in the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation. We have, um, as I've said, a network of international institutions and ex situ collections, 3,000 uh, of them uh, around the world. We have a global portal to accession level data, plant search, which I'll talk about uh, in, a, in a moment. Um, it is giving us at least a list of the taxa that are grown in botanic gardens and conserved in their seed banks. What we don't have is anything like a universal accessions uh, information management system. There are many different accessions management systems in botanic gardens around the world. There's, there's a, a few databases that uh, are coming up to some sort of an industry standard. Uh, and we certainly don't have advanced bioinformatic tools uh, in one place um, that uh, allow us to, to mine characterization data. But what we do have um, is some pretty impressive infrastructures. Uh, we have the most sophisticated seed banks in the world within our network, more sophisticated than those within the crop community, for the simple reason that wild species uh, are more complicated uh, to manage, to conserve, um, to grow. Um, there's some examples there. The Millennium Seed Bank here uh, at Wakers Place, 50 miles south of here. The Gene Bank of Wild Species in Kunming in China. Plant Bank in Mount Annan in, in New South Wales, the largest, most sophisticated um, seed bank in the Southern Hemisphere. So we have some impressive uh, infrastructures within our, our network. We also have um, technical expertise in some key areas of conservation, whether that's seed conservation, uh, whether that's ecological restoration, species reintroductions, 
uh, and so on. Um, and those, I guess, are communities of expertise or communities of practice within the larger network um, who are at the forefront of the science uh, and practice of some of these disciplines. And then if we look at collections, uh, we did a survey based on plant search, which is only a subset of those 3,000 botanic gardens. There's about 1,100 botanic gardens around the world for whom we have records. Uh, and um, Cambridge, um, Sam Brockington, many of you will know, in Cambridge carried out this research. Um, and really, just with that 40% sample, we can say that as a minimum, um, we grow a third of, of known plant diversity uh, in the world's botanic gardens and arboretum. Um, there are only 20 vascular plant families that are not grown in the world's botanic gardens, and many of those not for reasons because we can't, because we haven't got to them. Uh, and around globally, around 42% of threatened species are held um, in ex situ collections uh, of some sort. So how do we turn those assets, if you like, into a system that is rational and cost-effective? The first thing, of course, is, is to coordinate efforts and, and to prioritize them. Um, and as was mentioned uh, earlier, uh, I think, by um, Sicily, that uh, the IUCN Global Red List for plants is only about 7% uh, of plants. Um, and that's because it's using the IU system, it, the IUCN system, it's also uh, global assessments. So a few years ago, with the help with working with Q and with ZSL, uh, we started to put together Threat Search, which is a database uh, of all threat assessments for plants. So NatureServe, the US system, the system that the Australians use, Salmonets in, in Mexico, etc., they're all on there. And critically, so are the national red list assessments using the IUCN methodology. Uh, and over the last decade, it is the national authorities who have done the heavy lifting when it comes to plant um, red list assessments. So we have um, about a third of plant diversity uh, on that, um, um, on threat search that have been assessed to, to some level. So if we know uh, which species uh, we have, um, we know where they are, we know which ones are most threatened, we can go to garden search and we can see where is the botanical institution on garden search um, closest to those threatened plants. Uh, and where might we find the, the expertise um, uh, to work on those plants. And to do that, we can go to, to Plant Search, and Plant Search will tell us a number of things. It will tell us uh, the strengths of collections of those institutions. Uh, and it can also tell us, uh, in any case, where those collections are, are held and where there might be expertise in seed conservation, in conservation horticulture, in ecological restoration, simply based on the taxa uh, that are in those institutions. And that starts to enable us to match the people um, the facilities, the expertise um, with the species which um, are, are, are most at threat. If you take trees as, a, as an example of this, um, we estimate at the moment, well based on, on threat search, there are uh, around 25,000 of the 60,000 tree species have been assessed at some level for, for their threat status or using some methodology. Of those around 10,000 tree uh, taxa uh, fall into the threat categories. Um, and when you, you're talking about 10,000, you're getting down to a number which is, is a bit more manageable. If you go down to critically endangered against the D criterion, so tree species that we know, there are fewer than 50 individuals left, then we're at a number of about 500, and we have a list of those. So then it's again about matching those species with the expertise uh, and with the knowledge, preferably in the country of origin, and if not, then building capacity. Uh, and that building capacity then falls to um, those gardens that have skills in certain areas. So we manage the Global Seed Conservation Challenge, which um, is around 200 participating botanic gardens with seed banks. But within our network, there are around 400 botanic gardens that have wild seed banks and have expertise um, in around 100 countries. Um, for Recalcitrant species, um, those species that don't lend themselves to orthodox seed banking, and I'm just talking about ex situ conservation here. We're just setting up um, these consortia for some of these genera that's, that are challenging to build genetically comprehensive um, living collections. Uh, to, again, as a backup uh, and also for research purposes. So the Global Conservation Consortium for Rhododendron will be led by the Royal Botanic Gardens of Edinburgh, who've just appointed um, 
a consortium leader for that. Magnolia by Atlanta Botanical Garden. Um, Camellia, we, we, we need someone to lead that for the moment. Um, Oaks, Morton Arboretum has been leading the Global um, Conservation Consortium for Oaks for a number of years now. And then University of British Columbia has just agreed to take on ACER, to take on the maples. And there will be other groups that um, also need uh, this kind of approach to coordinate and create consortia in the centers of diversity, but also with well-resourced gardens with, with, with expertise. And then how that then translates onto the ground. Um, we manage the, the Global Trees Campaign with uh, FFI that is specifically targeting critically endangered tree species, uh, and particularly those against the D criterion, um, and working with local partners in every case and local communities for integrated in-situ and ex-situ conservation, but bringing in the expertise where we need that. Um, so we've just heard a talk on drones. I was talking to Ben Nyberg in National Tropical Botanic Garden in Hawaii just yesterday. We've had a lot of success in survey and inventory for species, um, and they will be sending a team across to Mauritius that is the world's hotspot for critically endangered taxa against the D criterion to train um, our counterparts there in those techniques. Um, ecological restoration, I could go on forever about ecological restoration, but we, we um, coordinate the Ecological Restoration Alliance, which includes examples like this one. It was interesting to hear Toby's talk on some of the work being carried out in the neotropics. This one from Hong Kong, um, Kadori Farm and Botanic Garden, have been working for the last decade on a highly diverse subtropical forest, 300 tree species, and now other, other layers, again, complicated um, and complex um, design, uh, methodological design to look at multiple variables. So we have these experts and this, this expertise within our network. Um, there are many other ways we can do this. We produce technical reviews um, showcasing best practice. Um, we're just about to produce a whole range of directories of expertise in specific area areas like ecological restoration, conservation horticulture. Um, there's a lot of other things going on that we can help to facilitate as, as a hub um, in these botanic gardens. <coughs> but um, as I'm the last speaker, and I would like to stick to time because people have done that, I'm going to move on to the last point that I need to make, and that is that really for me, the technical challenges are, are manageable. I think that if we can deploy the 60,000 scientists and horticulturists within our, our network, we can ma make a major impact and we can make a difference. But of course there are cultural challenges. Um, and one of those cultural challenges for us is accepting this challenge. Um, you know, you can go back to 2005, the Millennium um, Ecosystem Assessment. And what you will see right there uh, is managing a complex mosaic of plants uh, and animals within the landscape biodiversity. That is right up our street. That is, is something that um, surely we should be major players uh, here. And we can make this case. We can say that we can do all of these things. We can find plants. We can identify them. We can conserve them. We can grow and manage diverse species assemblages. And increasingly, we can restore habitats and reintroduce plant species. But I don't think that, uh, sadly, is, is enough. Uh, and this is an example of this in two weeks' time. I will be in Cape Town for the Society of Ecological Restorations meeting, uh, the meeting of scientists, uh, if you like. At exactly the same time, the policymakers and the financiers are going to be meeting in New York that same week. We need to be sitting around those tables with the policymakers and financiers because we can publish our papers. Um, we can even demonstrate practice at small scale, but we have a credibility problem, and that is that nobody is listening to the scientists. And when I think about the Bond Challenge, the huge changes we're going to see with people planting trees at scale, we need to be in that conversation, because otherwise we're going to have massive sterile landscapes created um, across dry forests, across savanna ecosystems, across tropical forests, because nobody knows how to put in diverse species assemblages with the right long-term impacts. So one of the things that we have tried to do is to set up um, an international advisory council. Um, this is 30 directors from six continents um, and 
to try to get some leadership in the botanic garden community and to start to get um, some statements on, on that. Um, that's a work in progress, um, but they meet annually and are taking a big issue each year. But I want to say also to all of you, I, I have you know, one other thing to say, and that is um, just to digress slightly. Uh, many of you from the UK at least will know about the How It Works series. Um, this is the, the How It Works series on the husband. Um, my wife received two copies of this at Christmas, which is a bit of a worry. But this is a manual for wives, and what it tells you is how husbands work and basically how you should manage them. Um, and there are a few stereotypes in there, I would say. Um, this is a husband. He may look complicated, but he's in fact very simple. He runs on sausages and beer. Um, and in that series is also the shed. You may have seen that. And this one really struck me. This is Roland. Roland is spending Easter in the shed sorting his screws. While his wife and children visit his mother, Roland is separating his screws into flathead Phillips posi drive, etc., etc. You get it. It needed doing, said Roland. Now we, I'm afraid, in botanic gardens can be a little bit like Roland. Um, a little bit like husbands. We uh, have been documenting, collecting, sorting for centuries. Um, and I put it to you that this endeavor, this great endeavor, this ex essential endeavor, is a means to an end rather than the end in itself. And I would say the challenge for botanic gardens is that we need to move into another era that takes the best of taxonomy and systematics and genomics and phylogenies. And we've heard all of uh, Nobody needs convincing in this room of their utility but to take that to solve these big societal issues. Because otherwise, in botanic gardens, we will become museums of curiosity. We'll become a place where you come to see extinct plants. Um, we have a choice to make, and I think the other choice, uh, which is to take the challenge uh, with society. One of the reasons I love P3 as a journal is because that's absolutely in its DNA, is to help to solve these problems. Thank you.